Now, this video is the fourth and final part of um, a series of videos on my Vinberg lecture on um, Vinberg's algorithm and Katz Moody algebras. If you want to see the first three parts, there should be a link to them in the description of the video down below. So, this part will be um, mostly about automorphic forms. Um, so, in the previous lecture, um, we described there was a sort of relation between hyperbolic reflection groups and um, Lie algebras. Um, this relation is a little bit mysterious. Um, so there are plenty of hyperbolic reflection groups that don't correspond to Lie algebras or even katz moody algebras and plenty of katz moody algebras that don't correspond to hyperbolic reflection groups. But there seem to be a few cases when there was a sort of strong relation between them. Um, the one we looked at in particular was where you take the even 26 dimensional Lorentzian lattice. And this corresponds to a, a sort of generalized Katz Moody algebra with um, Dinkin diagram, the Leach lattice plus some norm zero vectors. So th this was the subject of the third lecture, so I won't say too much more about it just now. Um, what we're going to discuss is that both of these um, objects seem to be related to automorphic forms. <coughs> Again, this correspondence isn't exact. There are plenty of automorphic forms that don't correspond to Lie algebras or hyperbolic reflection groups. And not all Katz Moody algebras or hyperbolic reflection groups seem to be connected with automorphic forms, but there are several examples suggesting there is some sort of um, interesting um, connection between these. Um, so I'll start by just recalling what an automorphic form is. Um, so the simplest examples of automorphic forms are just modular forms. Um, and a modular form is um, a function f such that f of a tau plus b over c tau plus d is equal to c tau plus d to the k times f of tau. Here, and the imaginary part of tau is greater than zero, and there are some other minor conditions that I won't worry about too much. Um, and and what's going on is, well, we, we have this mysterious fudge factor here. And if we ignore this fudge factor for a bit, um, you can see this is almost as saying, say, this is almost saying that f is invariant under SL2z. So here, um, these matrices um, A, B, C, D are in SL2 of z, which is just two by two matrices with integer coefficients and determinant one. And this acts on the upper half plane by a, b, c, d acting on tau is a tau plus b over c tau plus d. Um, <clears throat> so without this purple <coughs> fudge factor, we're just saying the function f is invariant under the action of SL2z. Um, this fudge factor means that f isn't quite invariant, um, but transforms up to an elementary factor. Um, what it's really saying is that f is a section of a line bundle under SL2z that is invariant. And line bundle is a sort of high, um, is a sort of high level way of saying that f transforms up to this, this fudge factor. And an example of an automorphic form we had in the previous lecture was um, delta of tau, which is q times product over n greater than zero of one minus q to the n to the 24, where q is, of course, e to the 2 pi i tau. Um, now, this function delta has uh, some obvious symmetries. So, so tau of delta plus the delta of tau plus one is equal to delta of tau. This is just obvious because you know, Q is invariant under tau goes to tau plus one. And there's a there's a sort of hidden magical symmetry which says that delta of minus one over tau is equal to tau to the 12 
times delta of tau. And now you see this says that delta of tau transforms like this for the following two matrices. We have the matrix 1, 1, 0, 1, um, corresponding to tau goes to tau plus 1. And we have the matrix 0, minus 1, 1, 0, corresponding to tau goes to minus 1 over tau. Now these two matrices actually generate um, SL2Z. So um, from this, we can easily see that delta actually satisfies this relation for all matrices in SL2Z. So delta is an example of a modular form. Um, so what's an automorphic form? Well, an automorphic form, we just replace SL2Z by a larger group. Now, SL2Z is contained in SL2 of the reals, and you, what we're going to do is we're going to replace SL2 of the reals by some larger Lie group and have a larger discrete subgroup in it. And then um, there's going to be some relation saying a function is invariant onto some fudge factor, and the fudge factor will be more complicated, and we'll see some examples of it um, fairly soon. Um, so the, the, the first example of an automorphic form is, is, is going to be the denominator function of um, the Lie algebra I mentioned earlier related to the 26 dimensional even Lorentzian lattice. And we remember from last lecture that this had a denominator formula which looked like this. If we take the sum over all elements of the vial group of um, some sine times um, omega of um, e to the or sum of tau n times e to the n rho, where tau n is the coefficients of the uh, uh, of the delta function, then this is equal to the product over um, alpha greater than zero of one minus e to the alpha uh, to the power of the multiplicity of alpha. So let's just recall what the various bits in it are here. Sum of tau n q to the n is is just delta of tau, which is q minus twenty four q squared and so on. Um, and the multiplicity of alpha was given by p24 of 1 minus alpha squared over 2, where p24 are the coefficients of 1 over delta, which is q to the minus 1 plus 24 plus 324q, and so on. So this is quite complicated. Um, and what this is doing is it's saying that a certain sum is equal to a certain product. And what I'm going to do is to show that um, if we think of this as being a function, we can think of this as being a function on the following um, space. Um, we take um, um, ii25, comma 1, and then we tensor it with the reals, and th then we have i times um, C, where C is the positive cone. Um, so you remember this is a Lorentzian space which has a um, double cone of norm zero vectors, and inside this we can see a, a sort of positive cone here, which I'm going to call C, and we're going to say that this uh, this is going to be a function on the set of vectors whose real part is anything in this space and whose imaginary part is in this positive cone. You can think of this as being an analogue of the upper half plane. So the upper half plane says the real part is in a one-dimensional vector space and the imaginary part is in a cone in the reals, which is just the, just the positive reals. Um, so let's see why this thing is an automorphic form. Well, you remember um, delta is an automorphic form because first of all it had some 
had an obvious transformation under tau goes to tau plus one and had a mysterious one under tau goes to minus one over tau. Um, well, so our function here has some obvious transformations. First of all, we can, we can uh, translate by elements of the lattice i i 25 1 which sort of correspond to tau goes to tau plus 1 we also have automorphisms of the lattice i i 25 1 well um we don't quite get all automorphisms but up to a factor of two um automorphisms of this lattice gives us elementary transformations there's also a non-obvious transformation um and we can get this as follows so here i had this um sum that I'm not going to write out again um, was equal to some product that I'm not going to write out again either and what we notice is the sum is a solution of the wave equation um, this is because if you look at the, the terms of the sum carefully you see that all these vectors appearing at are of norm zero and um, x of a norm zero vector basically gives you um, um, a, a, a solution of the wave equation. On the other hand, this product, if you take its logarithm, the logarithm is singular um, when um, um, v is imaginary and v squared um, is equal to um, 2. Um, so here, what's happening is the imaginary part lies inside this cone C here, and inside this cone, there's the hypersurface of um, vectors with V squared equals 2. It's 2 rather than minus 2 because we're looking at imaginary vectors. And this product actually vanishes here. And we can ask, why does this product vanish? Well, what we do is we recall that um, if we've got a power series, sum of A, N, c to the n and if the radius of convergence is r and all the a n's are greater than or equal to zero then um, then this has a singularity at r so um, you know a power series with positive coefficients has to have a singularity at the um, at, at the real point of its radius of convergence um, now if you look at this product we can work out um, ex we can work out where it converges by using the hardy ramanujan radamaka formula for the asymptotic behavior of um, um, the partition function or rather partitions into parts of 24 colors furthermore if we take the logarithm of this all its coefficients are well they're not all positive they're all negative but that's good enough so um, using this, we can we can see this product must actually be singular on uh, this surface here. On the other hand, this sum here is non-singular, so this sum must actually vanish when um, v is imaginary and v squared equals two. Um, well, now what we notice is that um, if, we, if we let's call this function phi. So we've got these two functions. We've got this function phi of v. So it's going. So this is a, a, a solution of the wave equation that vanishes on this hypersurface. On the other hand, if we look at the the function v v over two to the twelve times phi of minus v minus two v over v v, um, we can check this is also a solution of the wave equation. I mean, this is just the transformation of the wave equation under under a certain um, conformal map and um, the fact that this function vanishes on this hyperplane means that these two functions actually have the same zero and first derivatives on this hypersurface so um, we can now apply the cauchy kowalewski theorem which says that <coughs> two functions that satisfy the wave equation and um, have the same zero and first derivatives on a Cauchy hypersurface must be equal. Um, so these two functions are actually the same. Well, I guess I should have put a minus sign in there. So here we're applying the Cauchy 
Kolevsky theorem. So um, what we have now is a, a, a magical extra transformation of this function. So this kind of corresponds to this transformation of the function delta. And what we saw is that for delta, these two transformations um, mean that we're actually transforming under the group SL2z. Um, well, if we put together all these transformations of this function phi, what we see is that phi is an automorphic form for the group. Well, what we do is we take an orthogonal group of the lattice 25 comma 1 um, over the integers. Well, uh, again, it's up to a factor of 2. I should really take a subgroup of index 2, but I won't worry about this. And this is contained in the Lie group where you um, just take um, it's a 26 dimensional um, Lorentz group. Sorry, um, should be 26 comma 2 here. Things mysteriously go up by 1. Um, so um, what we have is an automorphic form for um, a, a group which you should think of, you should think of this as being an analog of SL2z contained in um, SL2 of the reals. Um, and we can do this with for several other hyperbolic reflection groups. So we get the same for um, hyperbolic reflection groups corresponding to, um, well, if you take the Leech lattice and take the fixed point under some automorphism, that gives you a lattice rather like the Leech lattice, and you can sort of um, go through and get a similar reflection group in a similar automorphic form. So this has worked out in a few cases by um, Neiman and um, um, and generally by Scheithauer, who showed that if you take any automorphism of the Leech lattice with a non-trivial fixed point sublattice, then you can get a similar automorphic form for it. So that shows there are some hyperbolic reflection groups um, corresponding to automorphic forms. Um, well, now we have the problem. What about Vinberg's groups. So taking a, a fixed sublattice of the Leech lattice only gives you some rather special hyperbolic reflection groups, and these automorphic forms are rather special. They turn out to be automorphic forms of singular weight. Um, and it turns out you can, um, for um, all the groups Vinberg studied, and the answer is we take the form phi on i i uh, twenty six comma two, um, which um, uh, is actually an automorphic form on i i twenty five comma one tensor c with imaginary part um, in in the cone, and we can just um, pick a Dinkin diagram in um, the um, a Dinkin diagram of I I twenty five comma one, which is just the Leech lattice. So if we take some Dinkin diagram, let's call it D, and we look at the orthogonal complement of D, which is contained in I I twenty five comma one. So this will be some lattice, um, and then this automorphic form restricts to an automorphic form for the perp plus 0110. Um, it's only one slight problem. This restriction is identically zero. So although it transforms like an automorphic form, this is completely uninteresting because it's, it's a zero automorphic form. And the problem is that phi vanishes on the... Um, orthogonal complement of um, any root r. So in particular, um, d contains roots r, 
So the orthogonal complement of any Dinkin diagram, the automorphic form you get, will be identically zero. So that seems to be a little bit of a problem. Um, well, there's a solution to it. We can differentiate um, by before restricting. And what we can do is we can differentiate once for each hyperplane um, that it vanishes on um, in D. So um, uh, th th this will be half the number of roots of um, of the root system of D. Um, so so you know if, if D has as n roots there'll be n over two hyperplanes on all of which phi vanishes so what you do is you sort of make phi none vanishing on all these hyperplanes by first differentiating it um, and um, the, the effect of differentiating it is it, it, it increases the weight of the form phi well what's the weight of phi well you remember phi has this property that phi of um, um, 2v over vb is equal to minus v v over 2 to the 12 times phi of uh, b. Um, well, the weight is just this this bit here. Um, and um, so what we get is automorphic forms for um, various lattices whose weight is a little bit bigger than you might guess. So let's have an example. Suppose we take um, Vinberg's reflection group um, for I191. So he showed that the reflection group of this has a finite Dinkin diagram, just to, um, which was a little bit too complicated to do by hand. So Vinberg and Kaplinskaya um, got a computer to work it out. And um, um, the even sublattice is given by, it's the orthogonal complement of D6 in, in the Leech lattice. So, so we take a, a D6 Dinkin diagram in the Leech lattice and take its orthogonal complement. Um, by the way, in case you're thinking that Leech lattice has no roots at all, we're thinking of the Leech lattice as being the Dinkin diagram of the 26 dimensional even Lorentzian lattice. Um, so um, we get an automorphic form for um, I corresponding to I191 of weight, well, it would be 12 um, um, plus 60 over 2. Well, what's 60? Well, this is the number of roots of D6. Um, and similarly, for all other, for all the other um, reflection groups of even unimodular lattice that Vinberg studied, we can get um, an automorphic form of some weight. For example, for I21, one which was the largest one, we get a form of weight 12 plus. Well, this time um, we notice this is the orthogonal complement of D4. So uh, D4 is 24 roots, so we take 24 over 2. Um, and these automorphic forms vanish on the um, reflection hyperplanes. So um, each of these reflection groups um, has reflection hyperplanes and the automorphic form very neatly vanishes on these hyperplanes um, and um, if you want to des describe all the places where the automorphic form vanishes, it, it actually um, um, vanishes on reflection hyperplanes, not just of this lattice, but 
you, you know we have to make this lattice bigger by adding on a little two-dimensional Lorentzian lattice and in fact the automorphic form vanishes on on hyperplanes of roots of this bigger lattice so the automorphic form corresponds very nicely to the hyperbolic reflection group and tells you what its reflection hyperplanes are um, well I've now if, if we look at I21 um, something a little bit strange happens here this is the one where Vinberg showed the Dinkin diagram is infinite and we get an automorphic form corresponding to it and this automorphic form vanishes on the hyperplanes Um, corresponding to orthogonal complements of vectors r where r squared is equal to one two or three and these ones are not roots um so so, so something more complicated seems to be going on the automorphic form sort of notices the hyperplanes where the reflection group vanishes but it also notices some other hyperplanes that don't correspond to um um, reflections of the reflection group and this sort of seems to be related to the fact that the Dinkin diagram is infinite um, somehow the the automorphic form is this kind of causes the automorphic form to pick up pick up some extra zeros not corresponding to to reflections um, we can also look at the example of um, even um, unimodular lattices so so Vinberg looked at these two cases so I191, um, this corresponds to the E10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, um, 8, 9, 10. So this corresponds to the E10 Dinkin diagram, and we recall that this corresponds to um, um, bigger Dinkin diagram. So I'm just going to sketch that looks like this. We take two copies of the E9 that diagram and join them like that and the question is can we find automorphic forms corresponding to these um, and the answer is yes um, and this is going to give us a bonus because it is also going to tell us what is the nice Lie algebra corresponding to this so the question is um, can you extend the E10 um, Katz Moody algebra to a bigger Lie algebra with a nice denominator formula, and the automorphic form tells you how to do this. Um, so, what goes on here is again, we just restrict um, um, the automorphic form phi after differentiating it, of course, and for this we get a form of weight 12 <coughs> um, plus, um, well, um, we need to figure out what E10 is. Well, E10 is given by taking E8 plus E8 and then taking its orthogonal complement um, in the 26-dimensional even Lorentzian lattice. So we need to know how many roots does this have. Well, it is 248 plus 200, sorry, 240 plus 240 roots. So, um, which is 480. So it would have weight we have to add 480 over 2 and this gives us an automorphic form and this automorphic form um, turns out to be the denominator function of um, some sort of generalized um, Katz-Moody algebra Um, so this Katz-Moody algebra, the real simple roots are just E10, but it also has quite a lot of imaginary simple roots. Um, furthermore, this automorphic form again vanishes exactly on um, hyperplanes corresponding to norm two roots of this bigger lattice I I um, ten comma two. Um, so this seems to be arguably the correct. Lie algebra corresponds to the E10 root system. It's a, it's a Lie algebra corresponding to a, a nice automorphic form um, acted on by the, the orthogonal group of this lattice. 
And of course, you can do the same thing for this um, reflection group just by taking, just by regarding this as the orthogonal complement of E8. Um, th this sort of shows that you can't really understand the E10 um, Lie algebra with, without going up to 26 dimensions and, and then restricting the corresponding automorphic form. Um, there are several other examples of um, um, finite reflection groups corresponding to automorphic forms. These, these were studied by Gritsenko and Nikolin um, several years ago, who, who showed there were some other examples of hyperbolic finite hyperbolic reflection groups with finite Dinker diagrams that could actually be extended to correspond to certain automorphic forms. Um, um, so I'll just finish by um, mentioning a, a few open questions. Um, so, so the most obvious question is, can we classify various um, hyperbolic reflection groups? For instance, you can, um, you know, try calculating the, the the ones corresponding to lattices over the integers whose um, reflection group has finite volume. And there's been quite a lot of work on this by Nicolin and others. In fact, I sort of heard a rumour that um, this has recently been done, but I haven't yet managed to figure out what the details of this are. Um, we shouldn't actually restrict the ones of finite volume because the in, in some sense, the most interesting cases don't have finite volume. For instance, we have Conway's reflection group, um, which doesn't correspond to finite volume. As I mentioned, the analogues of these um, have been partly classified by Scheithauer. And recently, Brandon Williams, um, Yang, sorry, sorry, Wang, um, and um, Sun have some recent preprints where they get uh, quite close to classifying all the cases that look like this by, by classifying the corresponding automorphic forms. Um, I might put a link to their paper in the in the description of this video. Um, one of the interesting things they showed us is that the, the, the lattices you get are um, closely related to Schellekin's list of conformal field theories. So, um, so we can ask which um, of these hyperbolic reflection groups correspond to automorphic forms. Um, so these um, classify rather special ones that correspond to automorphic forms of singular weight. But as we've seen in the examples, there are quite a lot of automorphic forms that aren't of singular weight that also appear to be quite interesting, corresponding to you know, fin finite Dinkin diagrams or um, um, reflection groups whose fundamental domain is infinite volume. Um, another problem is find natural constructions of the Lie algebras. Um, the problem is that although we can construct the algebras from this, they're just given by generations and relations, which is a rather untidy way of describing a Lie algebra. Um, for some of the Lie algebras, this is known. For example, um, in the case of the Lie algebra of the 26 dimensional Rentzian lattice, there is a construction using the no ghost theorem from string theory. And for a few of the other um, similar Lie algebras, there, there, there are also similar constructions known. But for most of the Lie algebras we get corresponding to automorphic forms, I don't think anyone has found a really natural construction that doesn't rely on just writing down generators and relations. Um, next we can ask, what about analogues of II251 over other number fields? 
and sometimes you can find analogs over other number fields for instance if you take a fixed point free automorphism of this of order three you can use that to make this into a lattice over the eisenstein integers and that seems in some way to be a sort of eisenstein integer analog of this and then you can you know you can do things like look at reflection groups over the eisenstein integers and daniel alcock um, showed you could get um, several rather striking um, complex reflection groups related to this um, um, and th th then I uh, got a really crazy idea um, so recently um, Bia Zowska um, managed to prove that the leech lattice was the densest lattice packing sorry the densest packing in 24 dimensions using various magic functions um, so she had some magic functions associated to the leech lattice and to the e8 lattice and we can ask um, do analogues of these magic functions exist for um, fixed point sub lattices of the leech lattice and if so what can you do with these functions um, um so yeah so i think i'll leave it at that